JFK said, let's go to the moon by the end of 1969. At the point where he said that, the only thing we had done is sent up Alan Shepard in this little space capsule for 15 minutes and 22 seconds. That's all we had done. But yet JFK had the courage and the foresight to say, we're going to the moon by the end of 1969. So how are we going to do this? So we're going to learn how to crawl with Project Mercury. Then we're going to learn how to walk with Project Gemini. And then we're going to learn how to run with Project Apollo. These are the stepping stones to the first moon landing that took place. Let's talk about Project Mercury. You know, if you go to the launch site in the, in the Cape where uh, Alan Shepard took off, there's actually a plaque on one of the bunkers there that said all of the things that we did not know about space flight. We did not know if your eye, the shape of your eyeballs would change in a weightless environment and you wouldn't be able to focus. We didn't know if you'd be able to swallow. We didn't know if your inner ear and your sense of balance would get all messed up in a weightless environment and you'd be, just be nauseous and you'd be a big mess. We didn't know if the blood would flow through your veins just like it does in a 1G environment. And these are on this plaque at the Cape and yet we launched Alan Shepard into space and we had a lot more to learn about the ability of a human being to function in space. So Project Mercury had six missions, I talked about two so far, between May of 61 and 63. First we had two suborbitals using the Redstone booster and then four orbital missions using the man-rated uh, Atlas booster. And the objectives were simple. Place a manned spacecraft into orbit. Evaluate man's performance capability and ability to function in space and safely recover the astronaut and the spacecraft. And in that case, we're looking at man's ability to actually perform anything while in a weightless environment. The accomplishments, the last Mercury mission, the astronaut uh, successfully orbited for 34 hours. And we said, we're building confidence that human beings can function in space. All of our astronauts safely return to Earth and Mercury paved the way for the next phase where we're going to learn how to walk, and that's Project Gemini. Project Gemini had 10 flights between 65 and 66. The Mercury capsule, I mean the Gemini capsule, had uh, two astronauts. It was slightly bigger, um, but it was still a very cramped space for two people to be. And this is the retro rocket module right here. And this is the service module back here that's got all the equipment to keep the astronauts alive. But this is the Gemini capsule. And with the Gemini capsule, we are going to learn how to fly in space. We're going to do orbital maneuvering. There's a, the sophisticated thruster set on the spacecraft that allowed them to change orbits. We're going to do extravehicular spacewalk activity where, the, where an astronaut would open the hatch while he's in orbit and float outside the Mercury capsule and with a handheld maneuvering gun maneuver around the Gemini capsule. And then later on, they even did more sophisticated things like going to another Agena vehicle and removing a piece of, uh, piece of the Agena. But we did these spacewalks on Gemini 4, 10, 11, and 12. We did a long duration Earth orbit. How long can people stay up in space? We did that on Gemini 7. And on Gemini 7, we had two astronauts in the Gemini capsule for 14 days. And if you can imagine being in the front seat of a very small car with your best bud right over here, for 14 days and you could not even stand up, that's what they did. And that was Borman and Lovell for 14 days. We had the rendezvous of two-man spacecraft. These two guys were up there for 14 days, so we sent up another one. We sent up Gemini 6 to go rendezvous with Gemini 7. 
we're going to have to perfect our ability to do orbital rendezvous if we're going to go to the moon. And here we're learning how to walk. The next very important thing was Earth orbit rendezvous, and then we're going to take the next step. We're going to go and dock with another vehicle. So we sent up the an Agena, which is an unmanned vehicle, looks like this. And then when this is on orbit successfully, we launch the Gemini. And then the Gemini would track this down and orbit, orbitally maneuver to rendezvous and dock with the Agena, and then use the Agena's engine to change its orbit, to actually learn how to fly in space. And we did that on several missions, Gemini 8, 9, 10, and 11 did docking. And if you look at the sequence of events, we're getting more sophisticated. The first thing we do is launch the Atlas Agena. We get the Agena checked out in orbit. The astronauts start the chase. They rendezvous, and then they dock with the Agena. And the first astronaut to do actual rendezvous and docking with the Agena was Neil Armstrong. And uh, he had some difficulties after that because a thruster malfunctioned on the Gemini vehicle and he had to do an emergency disconnect from the Agena and come back and do an emergency splashdown. But thank God it was Neil that confronted those challenges because he was masterful in gaining control of the tumbling Gemini spacecraft. So accomplishments. We did rendezvous, docking, EVA, orbital maneuvering, and all the astronauts safely returned to Earth. And again, this paved the way to Project Apollo, which is uh, the uh, program that's going, going to actually land on the moon. But keep in mind, when we're doing Project Mercury and Gemini, in the background, there's a lot more work going on. We're actually starting to conceptualize the Apollo capsule. And this is the Apollo command module where the three astronauts would go to the moon. And we're also de designing and testing a service module, which is this piece, which provides electrical power, communication, life support to the astronauts in the command module. And you can see it has its rocket engine here to get into lunar orbit. And we're also designing, conceptualizing, testing a lunar lander, which looks like this. And this is called the lunar module. And this bottom piece would, would actually land on the moon. This bottom piece would serve as the launch pad for the top piece when the astronauts would blast off from the moon and return to lunar orbit to rendezvous and dock with the command module uh, which is orbiting the moon with one astronaut on board. Rendezvous and docking, we did that in Gemini. Now we're going to do it around the moon with Apollo. So that we're just learning how to really run with this, with this hardware. We're also building and testing the booster rocket for Apollo. This is what w w Werner von Braun said we had to do better than the Russians. And this is, has a thrust at the bottom of 7.5 million pounds. So this is a factor of 10 over the boosters that we used for even, this is the booster for um, uh, the uh, Gemini missions, the Titan booster, which is also a man-rated ICBM. But the, the thrust of this is about 10 times what the Titan produced. So Warner was right on. So let's take a look at more pieces of the mosaic. Now, one thing I did not mention is that all of these models that I'm showing you are to the same scale. So if you look at Alan Shepard's rocket that he went up, look at the size compared to the Saturn. Both are the same scale. Then if you look at the Titan compared to the Saturn, both of these are to the same scale. If you look at the Russian, this generated 800,000 pounds of thrust. Look at this compared to the Saturn. So you can see how the complexity and the challenges that we had to face to build this hardware is incredible. We also had to build the launch pad for the Saturn, the assembly building for the Saturn, the ground support 
for the Saturn. All of this was being done while we are in the process of launching astronauts and learning how to actually fly in space. Apollo was coming together. But there's something else even going on, and that is unmanned probes. Look at the president said, go land on the moon by the end of the uh, decade. How are we going to do that? And we're gonna, um, that's what we're trying to do here. But what do we know about the moon? Looks pretty nice when it's a full moon and a beautiful clear sky. But other than that, we know it's got craters. We know it's mass. We don't know what the surface is like. So we needed unmanned probes to go up and explore the moon to see how we're going to land on it. So all of this work that I'm going to tell you about is going on in parallel with Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo design. First was the Ranger project. And these were impactors. They were designed to crash into the moon. No uh, sophistication about this. And as they're getting close to the moon, they're going to send back pictures and video. And for the first time, we're going to see the close-up shots of the lunar surface. We had three impactors um, in 64 and 65. Ranger 7, 8, and 9 successfully crashed. It's kind of a strange thing to say. They successfully crashed into the lunar surface. They sent us the videos. And Rangers 1 through 6 all failed. The president said this wasn't going to be easy. And six of our first Rangers all failed. But we did get three that did work and gave us valuable information. The camera, by the way, is right up here. And then there's an antenna over here that transmitted the imagery back to uh, people on Earth. Next thing we wanted to do was get onto the lunar surface. So we had the surveyor project, five landers. And um, we had uh, one, three, five, six, and seven actually landed on the surface. This is what it would look like, kind of a spidery thing. This is the camera. And on the other side is actually an arm that would go out and, and actually dig into the lunar soil to see what its consistency was all about. And they studied the surface conditions and composition and sent back a lot of valuable information about the, what the surface of the moon was actually like. Was it dust? Is it clay? Is it rocky? Surveyors told us that. Now the president said, go land on the moon. Where are you going to land? So we sent up lunar um, uh, orbiters, four orbiters, and uh, these orbited the moon and sent back mapping pictures so we could actually identify potential landing sites. Then the last was the Explorer project, and here's the case where the president said, go from the Earth to the moon. Well, what is in the middle in that space between the Earth and the moon? What kind of cosmic rays, solar winds? What's the plasma and also the magnetic fields in that area? And that's what we had to go out and measure so we can successfully design the Apollo command module to uh, protect the astronauts. So with the Explorer project, we got that information. <clears throat> so Project Apollo summary, we're getting close now. We had five development flights between October 68 and July of 69. And like I said, Apollo 11 was the last developmental flight. Um, Apollo capsule and the lunar module, three astronauts. We used Saturn 1 and Saturn 5 boosters for these uh, flights. And the objectives of, of Apollo were to evaluate the performance of all this new hardware that I told you about confirm the rendezvous and docking like we did with Gemini between the command and service module and lunar module, exercise lunar orbital operations, now we're getting serious, and then perform a lunar landing. And finally, we did that on July 20th of 69, and Apollo 11 was the final developmental mission. So to put this all together, we have the Saturn V, Booster right here, like I said, above this point here is all payload. And tucked away inside this shroud is the lunar module. And then, after this is launched, the command module <coughs> will, in fact, be joined to the lunar module. So all of this hardware is being built. Project Apollo, we completed six landings on the moon and it got to the point the last three actually brought a little battery-powered 
cart that the uh, lunar astronauts drove around on. And in Apollo 17, they were on the lunar surface for 22 hours, and they covered over 22 miles on the lunar surface. And one of those astronauts was the geologist that had trained all the other astronauts before. He finally got his day uh, in Nirvana to go and actually be on the lunar surface himself in the lunar rover collecting samples of things that he thought were interesting. <clears throat> Spacecraft to achieve the landing, we talked about the command and service modules. Here's the, again, the command module with the astronauts. Here's the service module. And this is about 63,000 pounds total with these two. The lunar module uh, takes astronauts to the lunar surface and that's about 33,000 pounds. So all of the hardware to get to the lunar surface is about 100,000 pounds. The lunar module is a bit more complicated. This is the descent stage that takes them down to the lunar surface. And then when they want to go back, they will blast off using this as a launch pad and the ascent stage will take them back to lunar orbit, to rendezvous and dock with the command module that's orbiting, supports two astronauts. Now about the Saturn V, pretty big bird, weighs 6.2 million pounds, a uh, lot of propellants, 5.6 million pounds, but when those engines light off, they generate 7.5 million pounds of thrust. A very gutsy call by NASA was to launch the first all-up unmanned flight in November of 67. They didn't say, we're going to test the first stage, then we're going to test the second stage. They said, put it all together, let's get it on the pad and light it off. And they did that, and it was complete success. Totally amazing. Unfortunately, the second, which was Apollo 6, was a near failure. Two engines in the second stage shut down, and there was a pogo effect on the first stage where there were oscillations like this of very high frequency because of the propellant uh, pressure going into the engines. So Werner got his team working on this. There was a wiring problem, believe it or not. There was a miswiring on the second stage, and they also found uh, a solution for the pogo effect and then they were, this was cleared for manned operations. Then another gutsy call after Apollo 6 was to send Apollo 8 to the moon um, in December of 68. And that was a complete success. Three astronauts went in the command module and service module only. They went to the moon in this vehicle and they orbited the moon, I think it was 10 times, and then they came back and they also um, sent that very moving um, transmission back to Earth on Christmas Eve in 68, where they read from the uh, book of Genesis. But that was another gutsy call, sending the Apollo 8 to the moon after the near failure of Apollo 6. And then they followed with Apollo 9, which is the checkout of the lunar module in low Earth orbit, and then Apollo 10, which was a dress rehearsal, and those were both successful. One thing about the, uh, the uh, Saturn V, when you think about the Saturn V, you think of the F1 engines on the bottom. These massive, massive engines generating a million and a half pounds of thrust each. But you don't realize that this whole machine has 89 engines, solid motors, and thrusters. It has five engines in the first stage, five in the second stage, one, then the, um, the lunar module, descent and ascent, and the service propulsion module here. So 14 main engines. Solid rocket motors, it had 23. There are eight retro rockets in the first phase. In these, in these fairings you see here, there's actually two retro rockets pointed out, which would blast right through that fairing. After the stage separates, those retro rockets fire, 86,000 pounds of thrust each, and that would slow that first stage down and allow the second stage stack to keep on going. The second stage had eight ullage rockets. So after the first stage pulls away from the second stage, all of the propellants in that 
other than uh, those tanks are sloshing forward because there's no acceleration. And you've got to get that propellant to be resettled in the bottom of the tank to be able to light these five engines. So you fire off <clears throat> eight ullage rockets, and they accelerate the, the second stage stack just slightly to pull all that propellant into the bottom of the tank, and then you can ignite the turbo pumps and start your five J2 engines. Moving up here, you have four retro rockets, again, to pull the second stage away from the third stage, and then the third stage had two ullage rockets to do the same thing as pulling the propellants into the base of the tank. And then thrusters, <clears throat> attitude control, 12 on the um, um, command module, service module had 16, lunar module had 16, the Saturn uh, third stage had six attitude control, and then uh, we had the two ullage engines. And not to mention, there's one solid rocket motor up here for escape. So, when you look at the Saturn V, remember, it's more than five F1 engines. It's 89 solid rocket motors, thrusters, and main engines.